Namaste and welcome everyone. Beginning from the premise that gender is a fundamental factor of social organization, it is famously argued worldwide that political culture has been created by men for men. Although women have made a real difference in political life, despite their sparse numbers, especially at the top. Through today's talk, we hope to elicit recommendations for a more egalitarian future. Thank you all for joining us here today. I now request Usharani Manne, Chairperson Flow Hyderabad, to light the lamp and deliver her welcome address. Start with that. Special guests. Professor Rita Bahuna Joshi Ji, Sweta Kesvemi, fellow chairpersons, past chairs, my dear flow members, and viewers. Namaste. The 2019 Lok Sabha elections in India paved way for 78 women legislators to represent our parliament. However, according to the SDG Gender Index 2019, countries around the world have a long way to go to truly become gender equal when it comes to political representation. A major reason is the lack of women in politics in the highest ranks of power. Today's conversation will explore the implications of the gender structure for women in the historically changing Indian political culture. At Flow, we are now into our second quarter of operations and I'm both happy and proud to say COVID notwithstanding, we are firmly striding towards our stated purpose of ensuring that our members and the less fortunate community around us live empowered. In quarter one, we engaged you with new ideas that widen your worldwide through our power hours, of which this is the sixth one. Our knowledge gaps, of which we had four already, are designed to enrich you with insights and experiences that will move you notches ahead in your professional and entrepreneurial careers. To draw out the hidden talent in our own community, we have introduced Tea Time Talks. Hope you have sent in your entries for our second session on 16th. We have aligned ourselves with the national one flow mission and are seeing a lot of cross chapter knowledge collaborations. In the second quarter, we'll be introducing Game Changers, a five-site chat series wherein we will interact with our past eight persons and learn more about their personal and professional journeys. Also on the agenda are biz talks through which we will offer stimulation for curious minds through inspirational insights from accomplished business and process leaders. Knowledge Nuggets is a series through which we will introduce you to life skills much needed to survive and thrive in the fast paced dynamic world we live in today. And to enable those that are less resourced with more opportunities and employability skills, we are taking meaningful measures through our social outreach initiatives. Our MOU with Hey DD is seeing 20 women from the urban workforce picking up driving and delivery skills with guaranteed employment. The incubation cell is actively pursuing its objectives alongside WeHub. CIE at IIIT is keen to launch the Flow Incubator. We will come back to you soon with details about the same. 10th August, we'll see the launch of Flow Mentorship Cell Hyderabad, a self-reliant ecosystem for Flow members by Flow members. This is being launched by all 17 chapters and we'll see a lot of joint activity in keeping with the One Flow mission. As reported earlier, we have had a wonderful run at our new member intake sessions. The new member orientation was conducted in July, wherein past states Rekha Reddy, Rekha Lahoti, and I took the members through the origins, objectives, purpose, and opportunities at flow. 
the ambitious year-long mental, positive mental health campaign that was launched on 31st July will empower us and the community around us with the why, how, and when to reach out insights month on month. The groundwork and planning for the same is at an advanced stage. The sixth round of new member interviews is scheduled for the 18th of this month. Do intimate and encourage your friends to join and benefit from the Flow family. We are joining our forces with the government of Telangana's Haritaharam project and sponsoring tree gods in the Jubilee Hills area. I thank our committee for stepping forward so graciously to sponsor the funds for the same. Thank you all for responding to Flo's call to pledge your support for National Handloom Day and sharing your pictures on social media. We are planning a knowledge event around it and we'll reach the and you will get the details to you soon. Can we have the handroom day slide, please? Thank you. As you know, we have adopted the handicrafts village of Cheriel and helping the artisans recast their offering in terms of making the products more viable for the modern day lifestyle. I'm very happy to report that they have adopted very quickly and have brought out a wide range of articles that they had never before produced. The catalog for the same will be launched soon. I congratulate our EC member, Monica Bandula, for her inputs, advice, and incessant efforts to make this dream project take shape. Today's guest, Professor Rita Bahuguna, is a veteran academician and politician. I have met her just once when a flow delegation had visited Kumbh Mela in 2018. The few minutes of interaction with her left me in awe of her oratory and deep conviction for social good. I'm truly thankful to you, Rita Ji, for so graciously accommodating our request to share your insights and experiences with us today. I have known Sweta Kesneni since she was a little girl in pigtails and have followed her economic volunteer and political career keenly over the last two decades. Youngsters like her represent all that is good and heartening about the India of today. I wish her luck for her foray into politics and appeal to her to make a real and positive difference. To both of you, thanks for turning the spotlight on women leadership in politics and hope to see many more dynamic women like you stepping out to achieve the greater good. Over to you, Priya, now to take the program ahead. Thank you. Thanks so much. We will take just a couple of minutes now to introduce our distinguished speakers and honor them with a token of our gratitude for accepting our request and being here with us. Slides, please. Shweta Kesineni to initiate the discussion on women in political leadership, then to now with Professor Rita Bahuguna Joshi. Shweta. Thank you, Usha and Priya, for the lovely introduction. I would like to take this opportunity to thank the Fiki Ladies Organization for this wonderful platform that you've created. Also, a happy handloom day to all the lovely ladies here. You're all looking gorgeous. Uh, Rita ji, namaskar. It is such an honor to be conversing with you on a topic that I know is close to heart for the both of us.
के तरफ से प्रसारक बुंदेले हर बोलू के मुंह से हमने सुनी कहानी थी खूब लड़ी मर्दानी वो तो झांसी वाली रानी थी I know the name of the great Jhansi ki rani Lakshmi Bai to remind us that India has historically accepted and celebrated female leadership. Rani Lakshmi Bai has become a symbol for women's empowerment in India, often used as a metaphor for courage and bravery. However, when immortalizing Rani Lakshmi Bai and recounting her tales of valor, we often use the word mardani. I wonder if by celebrating female leadership in this manner we are subconsciously only inculcating into our society the acceptance of one form of leadership the one that fits into patriarchal molds so we haven't equally immortalized and idealized the likes of sarojini naidu ji a great great and gifted poet whose fierce advocacy made her one of the most prominent figures of the indian freedom struggle or savitri bai phule the india's first female teacher who faced public humiliation and stoning in her crusade to educate women or razia sultan a female mughal ruler who actually promoted the study of what was then called space science and the universities and research special facilities that she built actually serve us until today so there are thousands and countless such stories of women leaders and revolutionaries from then to now each with a different style of leadership each with a unique journey that can be an inspiration to many so the question we ought to be asking ourselves is are we celebrating them enough are we giving them enough prominence in our history books and how is that impacting our present day expectations of female leadership so we will discuss this more uh, with rita ji but let's first look at some data on india's performance in terms of female political leadership can i have the slides please great in 1966 when indira gandhi ji became the prime minister of india india was only one of two countries in the entire world that was led by a female head of state how wonderful is it that we were the global pioneers in hailing in a new era of governance with women on top What's also interesting is that till date we're only one of five countries across the world that have had a female head of state for more than a period of 15 plus years. So let's ask ourselves how far have we progressed since then? Slide 2 please. The Women in Politics 2020 data by UN Women analyzed 193 countries to show that and there has been an increase in female leadership across the world so we have seen an upward trend however when it comes to the case of india we now rank 146th in the position of percentage of women leaders in lok sabha we also rank 134th in the position of women leaders in ministerial positions at the center so does this mean that india is not at the forefront of this upward trend slide 3 please when it comes to the lok sabha we have seen growth in women's representation since 1952 to the present day as usha ji mentioned we actually had the highest recorded percentage of women mps in the current lok sabha makeup which is 14% but the data does suggest that the growth that we've seen has been slow and uneven slide 4 please when it comes to state leadership India has historically only had 16 different female chief ministers over a 70 year period these leaders are represented in the 
states in United uh, Union territories that are highlighted in orange on the left. The highest ever recorded number of female chief ministers in India at a single point in time is six for a short period in 2003. And fast forward that to today, 2020, we have only one sitting female chief minister in the entire country. Slide five, please. The data does suggest that there is an inherent gap in representation of women in this country. But we must ask ourselves, is there more to the story? Also, where do we go from here? And what can we do to better female representation and leadership in India? Let's discuss this and all more with a woman that has spent her entire career first as an educator and later as a policymaker on empowering women from all walks of life. Rita ji, with your permission, we'll begin the discussion. Hi. So Rita yeah. ji, you have held a wide range of leadership positions from local governance to national governance. You were one of the most promising mayors you know, in the UN uh, um, um, initiative that you were also a part of. So can you please tell us a little bit about your journey and how your experience actually varied at each stage and how that, as you grew, how did the political arena actually change with you? Well, let me first congratulate and compliment the Fiki Flo for having uh, this discussion and debate on political leadership among women because I know that uh, your social reach has been very good and uh, uh, the FIKI flow has done a lot of work in promoting entrepreneurship, that is, uh, you know, economic uh, uh, empowerment of women, social empowerment of women. But I think uh, it is right time that you've started a debate and discussion of women in politics, then and now. So I would say you have given a lot of commentary there and, I, and you've all talked about uh, the highest uh, levels of politics. But if I take you a little down, I, I think India is the only country who in local governance, we have a three-tier government. And in local governance, governance we had 33% reservation in 1991 uh, when we had the 73rd and the 74th amendments passed by the parliament. But right now, the number of women in local governance is about 45% which means that more than 11% women have made their way up uh, into the governance uh, structures at the local level because of their own performance. So what I feel is that uh, participation of women in politics has increased. Now, the, if you look at this recent election, 2019, looks of election, the difference between male and female voting pattern or votes was about one and a half percent when it used to be huge, 11%, 12% in the past, which means women are not bridging in that gap. They're taking interest in politics. Earlier women were not interested, so much interested in politics. But with education coming to them and with their uh, commitment and the local governance uh, positions that they're holding, they're also becoming ambitious. And when you were talking, I was remembering, you know, uh, how uh, the women's empowerment process uh, has shaped within the last 50 years. I'm one of those lucky people who've seen all the stages of women's movement. And I still remember as a young girl, a girl who was in the university, when the first uh, women's empowerment, uh, uh, you know, uh, this conference was held by the union in 1975. And we had a conference in Lucknow, and I also attended the same. Mrs. Gandhi had come to address, and there were lots of women there in Begum Hazrat Malpar. Wow. She's also an icon. She's also an icon of women's empowerment, Bega Mazar right. men, you know, during the, ninth, uh, the, the 1857 movement. So the question is that the participation is increasing. Their awareness is increasing. Initially, we were only recipients of, uh, of you know, social, uh, uh, social arms, you could say, or social benefits that were given by the, uh, by the government. From 75 to 85, women only say, all right, give them this, give them that. So those in the social sector, we were getting and getting benefits from the government. But then people, the women wanted participation. And after 85, the women in the 80s, you will see all over the world, there was an urge amongst the women to hold positions of power. And in a democracy especially, there is no more potent power than the political power. Because that is where everything emanates from. And in the 90s, it was speeded up. And today we can see that in the entire world, there has been a huge jump huge jump in the past 30 years amongst women uh, politicians coming to the fore. Yes, the numbers are few. They're not as much as they should be, we're about 50% population. In India, we have 49% women uh, to men. Yet, 
how many positions are we holding? Just 15% in the parliament, less than 8% in the assemblies, but remember, 45% in the local governments. So, as I told you, that uh, things are changing, not at the speed we would want to. After in the last election, in the US election, you have seen that 23% women came into power uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in the House of Representatives, in, the, in, the, uh, in Great Britain also in the House of Commons, there are 32% women. But look at the interesting part. When I was in the 80s and we would look at the world scenario, we would say that the Scandinavian countries are the best in women's representation. But today they've gone back and who's come forth? South Africa, Rwanda, these yeah. countries, these countries have come for the more than 50% representation for women, 45% representation for women. So I would say that, and look at Japan and China. What does, what does China have? In the Politburo, they have just one woman against all the men. So the question is that it's not only economic development that it will take women higher. It is the, con the consciousness of this society. We have to really invoke the conscience of the women and make them aware that politics is not a dirty field. It is good and we must all delve into it. But as you said, Asia is a male-dominated society. Even India is today. As you told, you talk to me. My both my parents were freedom fighters. Yeah. My mother was a postgraduate of 1942. My father was a chief minister for so long, minister. But when people ask me, who's your ideal and who's your inspiration? I say, my mother is my inspiration. Because a girl of 17 years, she would move with a pistol in her without any political background in the family. She would go to the university with a pistol to ki marenge ya marenge. That kind of a feeling in 1942. So my mother always inspired us, as you read Subhadra Kumadi Chauhan. She Absolutely. used to tell us this Rani Ki Jhansi from childhood. She would tell me about Aruna Asifani. She would tell me about, uh, about so many other women, the Chattopadhyay sisters of, uh, of Calcutta, of uh, Bengal, and how these women were in the forefront of the movement when the male all went into the jails. There was Kamla Nehru, there was Katsubura Gandhi, who had a silent, uh, more silent role. But there were these ferocious women who were really fighting head on against the British government. So okay. I think that now in the, this uh, millennium, and especially in this century, 21st century, women are not, not laid back at all. Every woman wants to enter politics, but what is the route? How do they get it? That is the major issue. See, you are highly educated. I'm very, uh, I was very happy to see your profile. Because Thank being you. or being only having a progeny, political progeny is not enough. Right. My parents did not allow me to join politics or even a political party till 1990. I was 45. Till wow. my parents were alive, they said, no, you stick to your profession. We are middle class people. Rosie roti ka dekho. Look at her, how you sustain yourself. So it was only after his death that I entered politics. So it's very tough. I was into social movements. I was into women's movements. From 74 onwards, I was head on into women's movement. And uh, till 1995, when I contested the first election. Like, I suppose you're going to do the same. In <laughs> you, you, right. Soon. So I contested an independent candidate. I, I said, let me try my luck and see how the people come forth. And trust me, being a good teacher in the university and being in the women's movement was enough. Because the students and the women, all politicians were nearly against me. I had no platform which was very well manned or uh, uh, you know where, where the top leaders would be standing. And I was very less known in the political circles in Delhi and Lucknow because I was teaching in the university. But I defeated every party badly. It was the 1995 height of the BJP movement, Ram Mandir movement, and yet the, and, uh, and from the constituency of Dr. Muli Manohar Joshi, I won by 45,000 votes over BJP. And That's Congress, lost his Congress lost his deposit, BSP lost his deposit, everybody won. Not because I was the daughter of Bhaguna. Bhaguna had gone away six years back. Yes, his good work did benefit me. But it was my own presence, which was motivated by my mother. I will tell you, my mother used to always tell me, that you should not be satisfied only by your individual you know, achievements. You should give back to the society what society has given you and give it back to women. She would always say, when everybody is thinking of themselves, why shouldn't women think about themselves as an entity? 
Very so, you true. know, I'm not a feminist, but I am for women's empowerment and for equality. And there should be equal opportunity. Political parties have not been giving that in the past. But as you said, very few women, but I think South uh, Asia has been very lucky. There were times when all leaders were women. Pandan Naike was there, then, uh, then uh, Bhutto was there, then Ms. Gan was here, Athena was there, or somebody else. So we in the subcontinent know the worth of women. That is right. And so I feel today, if you see in the government of India, all right, uh, we don't have a prime minister of Mrs. Gandhi. She was an epitome of uh, authority and power and uh, all that. A strong leader. Mrs. Thatcher was there in, uh, in uh, Red Britain. But uh, right now, I think this is a good phase for women in the past 10 years. We have held the position of finance. We are holding it now. Yes. We held the position of uh, defense, foreign affairs, commerce. So these areas which were considered to be out of the women's arena. And the women are weak. They won't be able to handle these positions. But these positions have come to women during this tenure of India government. And women have done very well. They have done very well. They have not shown weakness even at a single point of time. And for a long time, HRD was also with us. Today is the International Textile uh, Countries Textile, National Textile Day. And we have Smriti Rani sitting there. So I feel that uh, uh, with whatever it is, we have had very, uh, you know, uh, what is self, uh, 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 what is self empowered women coming to the position of chief minister? They right. did not have a good background as others had, but they still are there or were there. So I feel there's a lot of hope in the future. And for me, as you said, uh, having been a teacher in the university for 20 years, when I took over the mantle as the as the mayor of Alaba. Okay, it was very interesting. In the first meeting, I could read the faces of all my officers, <laughs> taking instructions and orders from a woman. Right. Even, though, even though in 20 years, I don't know how many PCFs and IAs had come out as my, my students had passed out to them. Right. A woman in authority and first woman mayor of Alaba. My mother was the, incidentally, my mother was the first woman uh, president of the Zilla Panchayat in uh, UP, in UP. And in UP, due to this reservation, I was the first in Alaba. So both the mother and daughter created history in that sense of the word. So they were, but it took a long time for me to tell them that no authority doesn't emanate from sex, it emanates from the chair. And it emanates from authority that a person holds. And today I think women are very confident. Why we should be self-respecting, self-confident, and I'm telling you, sky's the limit. Because you have seen how, uh, how uh, the International Women's Day has been growing right from 1975 to 2000, when was the last? It, it, has, it has grown massively. And uh, we know that today the women all over the world are coming together. Now, when I became a member, I became a, uh, you know, a mayor, we had 33% women in the house for the first time. Now they were right. so tame, they were so afraid of speaking. They didn't know, they don't have the confidence that if I speak, will I be speaking the right thing? So I made it a point that after every two males, one female is going to speak. And all of them had to speak. So gradually within one year, they all opened up. I said, Dil se bolo, speak from the heart. You have to talk about people's woes and their problems. Then I became an MLA, member legislature. Women would hardly get time to speak. Then I used to stand up and say, no, Mr. Speaker, you should give opportunity to women to speak. So that came in. Now we are in the parliament, God willing, the maximum yes. number since independence. But women are very active in the parliament. So let me Absolutely. tell you. Absolutely. Extremely active. And we are, as you said, youngsters. There is a huge uh, you know, group of youngsters, big group of youngsters. Absolutely. And I promise you, whether male or female, they're so well informed. They are so well read. They are so well prepared that it's it's a it's a pleasure to hear them in the house. Yeah, so that's very true, Dita Ji. It will change, but you'll always be assessed if you are a woman till now. Even today, having attained so many positions in life, I'm still I think males still want to judge me on every step. They may do whatever they like. And see the only constraint that a woman leader feels gets is. And we, we cannot you know, create those kind of uh, cliches or, uh, or, or those kinds of groups which men do. They have late nights, they party, they do politics. 
they do a lot of uh, diplomacy, they do a lot of uh, political uh, hangouts. We can't do that. Because we, whatever it is, women still draws her own line. She draws her own line, how and till what extent she will work. We are hardworking, we are sincere, and I think every woman politician wants to go up through the route of sincerity. And I would also tell the youngsters this, no shortcut please. It's not, like a, it's not like a job that you, you are in an organization today, two years, you skip there and there and there and then you try to make your way up. Don't think of shortcuts. Don't try to please anybody to, to get space in politics. Right. Work hard. And I tell you, if you work hard, people will walk down to you. You will not have to go to anybody's store. So there is a definite change. And we see that the young girls who have come into the panchayati system, how well they are doing. Absolutely. We have so many stories uh, of these girls who have transformed their uh, villages, whether it's water conservation or whether it's environment or whether it is schools or whether it is uh, health sector. So I think there's a lot of hope. We're also entering politics with the, the electoral politics. My good witness to you, and I'm sure that women will certainly work in a way that the 21st century will be no more against uh, in the name of women. You have asked one question in your uh, question that you sent me. Which are the words that inspire you? Right. You know, words. Absolutely. So you, you talked about Lakshmi Bhai. That is in our, our DNA now. It's in our blood. Yeah. <laughs> As Lakshmi Bhai in our DNA. But you know what challenges us is also? It is, you know, the Kavita, that uh, poem that was that that says, "Nadi teri yehi kahani, achal me dud, me pani." That is what we are fighting now. No, a woman is not one who grieves or who repents or who. It was a challenge. That was a challenge that was posed to us, and I think we are living up to it. And a very nice couplet I came around a few days back. I will read it out to you. Uh, a woman says, you know, you may shoot me with your words, uh, you may cut me with your eyes, you may kill me with your hatefulness, but still, like air, I will rise. So this is the concept that we have to take along with us, that nobody can stop us if you are worthy. If you are not worthy, then we should be satisfied with what we are doing in life. Thank you so much. That that was so incredible, Rita ji. I I honestly feel so energized right now. I feel like I could just go for a run immediately. <laughs> no, it's really like it's such an amazing experience that you've had until today. You know, with whether it's recounting how your mother inspired you to how you have now inspired you know thousands of people, not just in your constituency. You know, the fact that we know you here in South India, you're so well renowned, actually speaks so well about like the kind of work that you've done. Um, I would like to go back to this one point that you raised about how the sky is the limit for us. And uh, uh, can I invite Usha ji to actually uh, ask this next question, which is very in line with what we want to ask you. Usha ji. Namaste, Rita ji. Namaste. Uh, when Srimati Indira Gandhi became prime minister in 1966, India and Sri Lanka were the only two democracies in the world to have a female head of state. But in almost 40 years since she has last held office in 1984, we haven't had another woman prime minister. Do you think there are barriers to female leadership at the topmost level of governance? See, leadership is born. You, can't, you cannot uh, impose leadership. Leadership, you know, qualities will bring you to the fourth. Look at the world history, wherever. Leaders have emerged. So a leadership will have to emerge, and they will emerge someday. Because India is always open to women leadership. India has no qualms about women leadership. It was, there was a Durgavati, there was a Padmavati, Jachi Ginani, there was a Chan Bibi. So it's not that we have, that society is averse to their leadership. But we have to throw up a leader. And that has to really come from amongst the masses. You can't impose. So I feel we will have, let us pray we have a woman leader as soon as possible. And uh, it, is, it is not at all impossible. But we cannot say that, okay, Rita Ji will become our leader or Usha Ji will now lead the country. The people will have, you know, democracy, the people should come with you. And that comes only when you, your role is acceptable 
to the mass. Thank you. Over to you, Sveta. Rita ji, yeah. Yeah. Rita ji, you have been fighting to level the playing field for women for a long time now. And in your opinion, what can each of us do at an individual or an organization level to uplift and empower women, not just in politics, but in every single sector and across all levels of economic activity? See, right now this uh, COVID-19 pandemic has thrown up a huge opportunity to us. Because now indigenous, uh, uh, you know, trade and indig indigenous uh, manufacturing is being promoted by the government. So in this, uh, we are a traditionally, uh, you know, country of uh, handicrafts. We are a country. We are a country of cottage industry, small scale industries, a micro industry. And if you go around, at least in UP, as I see, every home has women entrepreneurs in the sense they workers. Uh, they, they, they are good, whether it's Zardozi or it's chicken or it's, or it's Banaras uh, no, uh, Banati uh, work, or whether it's the Bengal industry or the carpet industry, men and children are the best, uh, you know, the most uh, accomplished uh, uh, workers. So I think uh, the government is now promoting women leadership in econ economic economy. Banks are being now, you know, motivated to give more loans. They have been asked in every every branch, rural branch of uh, the government uh, bank, to identify a woman entrepreneur and give us support, uh, financial support, uh, loans. Besides these, these self-help groups are a great source of, you know, Andhra has done so well in self-help groups. It has really the best history uh, in, in the promotion of self-help groups. If you could really, through people like you, train them into crafts, you know, in, enhance their skills. So I think the best way right now is to, and I'm, I'm trying to do that. I'm trying to catch up with these self-help groups in my constituency. And, you know, we enhance their skill according to the needs of the time. What kind of products are required? Supposing there is duty in my constituency, or there is chicken in my constituency. What are the designs and how should we upgrade their skills? I think this is one field where you can do a lot of work. You can, uh, like the Fiki Flow in UP, had a, when I was the Minister for Women and Child Development, uh, the Fiki Flow here, it was at that time headed by Renuka, uh, Renuka Kumar, sorry, Renuka Tandai. She organized a huge uh, women's, uh, women entrepreneurs uh, uh, festival over here. And the CM inaugurated it. I was amazed at the kind of crafts that the women were coming with, not only the poor women. Even women from middle class, from upper class, who are looking for identity, they were all there with their products, with their designs. So I think that's a good effort. And we have this, uh, uh, Menkaji was telling us that they, they have created a portal, you know, this e-portal e for women only. If you could link these, link these women with that e-portal, which is free, uh, free portal, uh, they don't have to pay anything for it. So I think, Enhancing their skills and connecting to the, uh, with, the, with the market is one thing that you can do a lot of uh, good work, and you are doing it. Right. I can see it. Yes. So that is one thing. And uh, besides that, I think education is one another area where you all can, at the rural level, uh, right. you can uh, help uh, girls come up because you see most of the girls drop out of schools after five and fifth class or eighth class. The right. government has many schemes. How do we access them? How do we make it accessible to them? So in education and in the entrepreneurship for enhancing skills, that can be done, as I can right. see. Definitely. And I think Flo uh, has been doing such a great job with it. I think Usha ji can also mention that here. Sorry, you know, we can't hear you. Is Ajinder ji also there today? She did? No, no, she hasn't. Yeah. Yes, uh, Rita, I, I wanted to ask you what's your take on this subject as a youth leader. Okay, definitely. Um, firstly, before I do start, I have to mention that the work that Flo has been doing, whether it's in terms of skilling women or promoting handlooms and you know local arts, I really find that very great. And I think every organization and every uh, you know, whether it's a state level or a national level should really take up these initiatives. So kudos to Flo for doing that. And uh, I, to answer this question, I have to take from my experience as part of the Tarot Trust. 
you know uh, i found that women can be such a powerful influence in the entire community so in our rural development projects actually we used women as our main liaison into the community so whether it was self help groups or uh, mahila gram sabhas or anganwadi workers anms ashas female school teachers so there is an existing power grid of women leaders within the village unit and by the most part they're not aware of their ability to influence change so we always structured our programs with them in mind and whether it was an awareness program or a community cohesion activities development planning and implementation whatever we did in a village we ensured that there was 100% a participation from women and the impact that we created was extraordinary it was never something that we expected and you know these women are so effective in instilling and reinforcing values into their family systems into communities that you end up creating a more holistic and sustainable change and we experienced this not just in one village or two villages this was across thousand villages that i worked on as part of the tata trust so you know this this is something that we were able to do by harnessing that untapped potential of women so in any setting not just in the rural settings i think the way to uplift women is by enabling those power grids you know find those in within you uh, around you in your sector and create an ecosystem of mentorship that essentially enables us to work from uh, uh, like learn from each other and experience our, each other's leadership styles etc so if you are a young person like myself you should seek out women leaders to be your mentors so it it may be daunting at first but you know right now with you have linkedin you have twitter it's so easy to reach out to people that are veterans in your industry and the fact that i'm right now able to sit and talk to somebody like vita ji i would have never imagined could happen but it it's it's possible it's all possible you know and as a women leader take initiative to mentor people that are around you that you think you can add value to so this is not just at an individual level at a organizational level as well if you own a company start a mentorship or a buddy program you know where you link up people that have progressed a little further in their career with people that are just coming in so that the next time a woman come a young woman comes into an industry it doesn't feel like she's choosing that road that's not been taken before so that's my two bits about this and i think that often i i find that women that all all around us we essentially lack the confidence in our own ability to inspire other people so we may have taken immense and big strides in you know empowering ourselves and we uh, might be at the top of our career but we still like lack that confidence to think that we can provide inspiration to somebody else we ground ourselves we uh, you know treat our successes with humility and that's part of the reason why our journeys are not being recounted enough because we ourselves are not talking about them so let's tell those tales of our in undeterred determination that actually got us to where we are today and in that we essentially are you know harnessing our power to empower other people well said sweta thank you um, um, sweta i would like to ask you one more question that is uh, sure. you have campaigned in both us and india right and how do you compare the two <laughs> so usha ji i think i can talk about that all day if you let me but let me uh, uh, address one uh, aspect that i think can help us with this conversation so my experience in both the countries has been rather unique and enlightening and i think that cross generational cross regional experience actually helped me really a lot in becoming a better critical thinker and hopefully someday a better leader um in the us though i was a uh, overseas student i was just there for my studies but i was neither a resident nor a citizen but it was due to my interest in policy and governance that i actually started looking around for opportunities to learn and i found that they were actually there in plenty you know and my experience with the mayor's office or whether it's the georgia senate campaign or later being recognized by the hillary clinton campaign all of these in all of these i actually found a structured way to essentially engage and participate in the us politics as a student leader so the opportunities are actually available to all youth leaders in the us from from their schooling days so parties actually place that high importance on grooming their leaders from a young age in in a way that doesn't disrupt your education or your future career so uh, when when it comes to that i really 
really appreciated that also i found that in, there was encouragement from my university to also engage in politics in a healthy way but when you compare that to our situation in india right now obviously back in the day you know student politics actually created a great launch pad for young leaders to go into politics in terms of the national and uh, state level so you had leaders like arun jetli or nitish kumar or rajnath singh ji or you know chandra babu naidu ji so all of these were actually student leaders and they became top political leaders of the country later so in terms of the present day scenario uh you you when you looking at the kind of youth participation that we're getting we see a lot of political parties actually engage with youth in when it comes time for the election campaign or when whether it's a political demonstration or rallies etc but what about when it comes to leadership positions and leadership opportunities i feel like the youth of this country definitely does tend to be overlooked and the active engagement that youth are actually putting into political parties today is not actually translating into a career for them so you know you you uh, are uh, seeing a lot of debate i'm sure about you know people discussing whether student politics and student unions are actually good and whether they're disruptive to the education system etc there's also uh, you know states like maharashtra andhra pradesh and karnataka etc that have banned student elections for a long time now um so you have to ask yourself like what is the pipeline essentially if a bright young person wants to start a career in politics in india what is the pipeline and how long will the journey take for them to actually get to the top so i mean essentially my question here also is you know we are a young country we have only 65% of uh, uh, the population is actually below 35 years and you know we only have a handful of uh our uh, leaders we can actually count on the hand that are below 35 or below 30 that are representing us you have like you know mp chandrani murmu from uh, uh, odisha you have tejasvi surya from karnataka or ram mohan naidu in ap so all of these leaders they are almost shown as like this rare example of youth leadership in india but but is that enough you know and uh, are we actually getting the kind of opportunities that we actually need to so that's something i also want to discuss with rita ji rita ji if i may ask you know we are seeing more youth and women also like you said in the local governance in india but when it comes to national politics however you know lok sabha mps you know the average age is 50 years and the cabinet ministerial uh, candidates their average age is 60 years so why is it that you know we're seeing this gap in representation and do you think that there's a resistance to providing leadership opportunities to the youth in the center I, I, to some extent i am with you but to some extent i like to think about uh, one aspect see those who are now ministers at 60 when did they start their career they started their right. career at 25 26 they were also young and they were then representing either losing, losing or winning elections but they stuck to social work stuck to political parties and they gradually to uh, you know came up to those positions so uh, i think uh, uh, a lot of youngsters are getting uh, getting tickets in the parties but the question is supposing somebody is 45 or 50 and he's put in 20 years and he's served with the people and the people want him the workers want him to contest then finally within the party also you have to judge and see whether availability is a very big issue and whether your candidate is winnable or not one to whether he is acceptable to the cadres or not to three whether he will be acceptable for vote to the voters or not so in that i think uh, uh, the youngsters are there but they are gradually coming up now as you see who has been groomed as the uh, in the finance ministry he is a youngster isn't he <laughs> he has been trained now so and what about babul supriyo he is also there like them there's so many others who are being trained at a lower level and see and most of these youngsters come from the states the state governments in the state government you see up half of our state ministers are youngsters they are being put with uh, senior cabinet ministers to learn uh, governance so i feel that uh, uh, those who are now in position at the age of 50 they must have been somewhere at the age of 25 also it's not that they have just zoomed in right so it, it is true we should have more prayer. and then when you go to see the chief minister look at up chief minister what age did he become a chief minister 
What age did the Prime Minister of India, Rajiv Gandhi, become? He was around 40. What was the age of Mayawati when she became the chief minister? What was the age of Akhilesh Yadav when he became the chief minister? So the ultimately is the acceptance that is essential. And at least you have to run a government for five years. So a leader should be worthy enough to keep his people together. And in an age of coalition governments, if you have a very inexperienced young uh, politician, then maybe the government will fall or the government will not be able to function. Go on those days when you're a good majority. So I feel that, and I look at today's prime minister, he's more acceptable to the youth than the youth leader himself without taking names. So these are all, you know, phases in, his, in, in the politics. And I think ultimately in a democracy, it's the people who matter. It is the voter who matters. But I agree with you that more opportunity should come to youngsters. There is no doubt about it. But, um, and the elder olders, like uh, the BJP has decided and nobody beyond 75 will be allowed to even contest. Right. So that is also a good step. I think that's not a bad step. Maybe the age can be reduced further later on. Maybe 70 could be the benchmark. So uh, don't feel disappointed. And uh, there's a lot of scope for youngsters. Find your way in and see how they have fun. They are uh, performing in the parliament, in the Vidhan Sabha. Most of them, they are talking. The seniors are sitting here. They laid back. The youngsters are taking on. So. Right. My good wish is for all the youngsters, and I hope we are a young nation. We'll have a lot more people like you in politics. Thank you. Thank you so much. Urshaji, would you like to take on the next question? I have a question to Rita Ji. Uh, of course, this is uh, a very common uh, a common interview question for women leaders is, <laughs> how do you balance your personal and professional life? How do we break through this attitude of being viewed uh, primarily as homemakers? Well, I think if you manage your time well, you can do both very well. I give two hours a day to my home in the morning. That's my own time. I don't start my public life before nine o'clock and I rise at five. So women, as I said, we have to work doubly hard. That's true about it. And we do it willingly, not under any pressure. My husband has studied abroad all his life. He has a very open mind. He would not want me to serve him tea or to look after his wardrobe yet. It, it pleases me because I've seen my mother doing it. I've seen my grandmother doing it. So as much as I can do, as much as I can do, all right. I can't do the cooking, uh, regular cooking, routine cooking. Uh, so I feel that, um, yes, the amount of time a homemaker gives to the home, we cannot give. Well, but, but we give quality time. And I think I'm a very, uh, except I think I will, I'm a very, I'm a favorite of my child. Yeah, I was a single child. Uh, he's now a grown-up man. He feels I'm his best friend. So my, I have a very nice family. We are very happy together. Everybody's accommodated. So you have to accommodate. If the husband did not accommodate me, if I did not organize myself the way I do today, we would have had a broken home. And that is not what we look for. So whether we are in a social service or we are in politics or we are into a job, profession, adjustments are required. And these adjustments, uh, uh, make a happy family. Men should adjust, women should adjust, everybody should come together. And that I think, I have a very happy home. I can tell you for myself, I have a very, very happy family. So, Rita Ji, I actually, sorry, I don't know if this will offend at all, but I wonder if there's a double standard in that, you know, in that we are expected to actually take care of the things at home. And if, if we have that's a person that's, that's understanding, you know, is that something that's great about the man or is that something that, you know, we should actually normalize in the society where both partners are actually putting in the equal effort? Is the, is the problem the society? So societal mindset is like that. So right. when we walk out, when we walk, walk, walk out of home, if supposing a male is in a commanding position, I'm talking about myself as well, and I follow him, it's okay because I'm the wife, he's the husband. So he can move two steps ahead of me. But if I'm the leader outside, if I'm more better known, then my husband, I think, will not feel happy uh, walking behind me. Yeah, that, that's essentially it. I'm gender dumb. Why? Yeah. Not because he has that mindset. He has on mind, what will the people say? So yeah. the societal mindset has to change. Because my husband doesn't expect anything from me. But he avoids going with me if I go to some program where he is, doesn't know people. He says, no, that's your world. You keep to yourself. He's an engineer. I to my world, you to your world, but make, let's make a happy home. But 
I feel sometimes, let me confess it to you, even when I move out with him, that maybe it's on his mind, what, what will people say, look, the woman is, the wife is going ahead of the man. Right. So these societal mindsets do bog, boggle, us, uh, boggle us also sometimes. Let me be very truthful. I also sometimes feel, then we wait so that the husband come, falls in step and we can walk together. I think a male doesn't think about that. A male, uh, a successful male will never think about this, except he's been trained well in the Western world, that you should open the door for the uh, wife or the family and wait for them to walk on. Indian males generally feel that a woman must follow. I think it will change. Change the generations after you. I, I think so. I think so. I think our generation is learning a little better, hopefully. Um, and maybe it'll get better by the next generation as well. Tell us your mind if I step in for one second. Absolutely, absolutely. Rita ji, so uh, we would like to know, are men also in the same position, ask the same work-life balance question? Or is it only reserved for women? Are men also asked the same kind of question about work-life balance? Or is it only women who are asked? No, nobody asks you. I think, you know, if you have a joint family and there are other women uh, in the family who are uh, homemakers only, then obviously there is a pressure that if these women are doing this kind of work, why isn't the most successful one doing the same? And as I told you, every thinking differs from man to man. And the man thinks differently when he's inside the home. And his psychology works differently when he's in the public, amongst the people. And woman is always expected to work harder and to perform better. A male may make a mistake, nobody will notice. But if a female makes the slightest mistake in her profession, or in her work, there will be criticism. They go, she's a woman, she can't do it. So I think all our, we still are at a stage where we are judged on every step and not on equal terms with males right now. Uh, even in the same positions, we are not getting the same kind of respect. The work distribution, you took a look at these services, the IS, uh, no, women in the IS, Indian Administrative Service. The males are getting what kind of uh, departments, what departments are the females getting? Absolutely. Are they, are they are toppers. They may be, they may have topped the IAs. But when it comes to distributing, uh, you know, departments, yeah. where are they? How many yeah. judges do we have? We actually right now only have two chief secretaries in India at present, out of 34 chief secretaries. I remember once, uh, about a couple of years back, when the senior most lady in Delhi who had to become a cabinet secretary, right. she was senior most, but she was uh, super senior for a male. Because maybe the male politicians feel it's easier to work with your own, uh, you know, uh, with males than with females. So I feel that things are changing now. Now with the finance minister as a woman, a defense minister having a woman, and now the conflict perceptions are changing. and. Uh, uh, they will change. Uh, we, I, I'm very, very, very hopeful for your generation and the next. <laughs> we are too. Uh, we are too. <laughs> I told now, I've crossed 70, so maybe uh, I have to, what I have to face, you will not have. Okay, absolutely. I think the, the women of your generation actually work so hard to give us this freedom and give us the opportunity to actually thread through this lighter and in an easier way. So thank you to that. Um, so I, I do want to ask you in, in terms of, you know, what, what you mentioned earlier regarding the, the expectations from women leaders and male leaders. So have you ever faced this when, like, you know, can you give us some anecdotes of a time that when you face this, when you're in office or any place where you face that, you know, the, the fraternity is working against you or, you know, whether the voters are expecting something different from you. When I was appointed as the president of the UP Congress, State right. Congress. Mrs. Gandhi appointed me as the president. Not a single male leader came to my support. Not a single male leader in the state of 22 crores. There was, they all wanted to see me fall. But I was okay. the women are very stubborn. Once we take a challenge, then we live up to it. So what I did was I ignored the top the top ranking leaders at all. I would be respectful to them. I would invite them to the group, but I would not bank on them. And I would not plead with them for support. I put this middle grade and the common worker with me. 
And I started worrying, you you will not believe it. I was a chief for five years. My daily average running by road was 500 kilometers. There's not a single block in my state which I did not visit two to three times. So I became popular with the workers. I became popular with the middle, middle rank uh, leaders. So the top one wanted to see me doomed. The strategizing yourself is very important. You have to be very intelligent to see that how, see if you get entangled into, uh, you know, political uh, embroil, if you, if you start, you know, fighting your, your the leaders at your level, then you will never be able to see. Just forget everybody and start, you know, creating your own benchmarks. Yeah. That will help us. We have to see who will help, who will not help. So, who will not help, be respectful to them, give them what is due to them, but then look for those who can work along with you. So, I think politics is a very intelligent uh, field. <laughs> it's all about chess, right? It's a game of chess is what people say. Yes, as you said, hard work, commitment and honesty. Right. These things are very important. And if you do that, that is what I tell the new generation, especially women. I find that women start seeking favors from established leaders. Don't do that. Be respectful to them, meet them, but create your own field. Even if you have one small constituency, whether it's a mohalla, a colony, or it's, it's a hamlet, or it's, it's a district. And if you are an established leader there, then nobody can take you for granted. They will come to you and you will get your place. Yes. That's great. Um, Ushaji, uh, did you want to ask a question? Uh, I think uh, I'm done with my... Okay. <laughs> so I actually, I still, sorry, I, I, I would just love talking to you, Rita Ji. So I have so many questions. I think we could go all day with this. But uh, yeah, <laughs> definitely. I would love to host you. I'm in Vijayawada, but uh, so I would love to host you whenever you're here. You uh, I have... Guest. Sorry, sorry. I said, when you come to Delhi, be my guest. Absolutely. I'll definitely see you there. <laughs> yeah, in the university, I, I gel very well with youngsters. Because okay. in 32 years, I've taught in the university. So 32 uh, you know, batches have come out uh, right. under me. So, so I, I'm very comfortable with the youngsters. I know yeah. how to I think that's why you're so great at explaining, you know, any of these issues. So these are complex issues, you know, and these are not easy for anybody to talk about. So you have a very good and, uh, you know, a free way of talking about these things. So I appreciate that. I did want to ask you specifically about your time as an educator. Uh, you know, do you think our universities are actually, you know, fostering that healthy environment of debate and discussion and dissent, you know, where everybody's opinions are respected and you actually are, you know, developing people's political acumen and their, their knowledge of world issues. Do you think that's actually happening in our universities right now? Well, I think it's happening amongst the youngsters. Uh, and as you said, with this virtual world being there, the internet, there's so much debate going on all over the world on every right. issue. And I, what, what pleases me is that there's a lot of constructive debate also. There is some, some political debate which gets highlighted. Right. But there's a lot of constructive debate about uh, what education is, about employment, about economy, about environment. So I feel that the youngster today is very, very conscious about his own surroundings and how what needs to be done. So I think about equality, about uh, human rights, about everything. There's a lot of debate going on and it's a healthy debate. And I think uh, uh, we, we're not so lucky to have so much access to so much of information, which okay. you guys have. So uh, there is a lot of, uh, talking about universities, I think the new education policy is going to be very helpful. Absolutely. Multiple entry and multiple exit as a teacher, I think. So yeah. you, will not be, you will not be tied down to one discipline. So a person in the law department can go to the science department, one in the science can come to humanities, humanity can access the, uh, the science department. This is a very good thing that's happening because you may have uh, multiple interests in education. That is one good thing that's uh, exit point is so easy. Absolutely. And uh, a lot of emphasis is being given on skill development. Uh, so that your future becomes better and globalizing education standards. Right. You, are, you have you've studied abroad also. My son also studied abroad. 
So creating a stru education structure which can in a, uh, globalize education uh, standards, I think things will change, they will be better, but as you know, at the end of it, political parties are there within the student quality, within student right. politics. Right. It reflects. It does reflect, especially when the elections are coming closer. In the Absolutely. <laughs> it does reflect. And uh, I think our teachers have a lot of, a very huge role to play. The, how so? How, uh, how do you say that? You see, what happens is what was my experience is that uh, the teachers in the university also get tied up with the students. Okay. That's not good. I was from a political family. My father was a chief minister. And why you can ask any student from the Allahabad University. I taught from 1974 to 2007. Never did I engage in the university election. I was into full-fledged into election activity outside with my parents, both were member parliaments. Yeah. And, but I said, not my workplace. I will not politicize my workplace. I did not take up any administrative position out of a fear that if I take any decision, one group will say she is Bhavuna's daughter, so she did this or she belongs to this party. So the teachers have a big responsibility. We should not politicize the campus. We should not engage in student politics. Mm -hmm. Let them fight it out. Let them do it on there. But I feel, my experience in my university was, that even among the teachers, there's a lot of politics. So one group of teachers using the students against the others. So what are you doing? Right. Ruining the perception. You're ruining the relationship between, a te between the teacher and the daughter. This I never did. Never, never did. I think this moral standard has to be set by the teachers. Themselves. Definitely, definitely. And I think they obviously the, your students will learn from you and how you know non-partisan you had been during your education or during your teaching essentially. But I, I do want to ask you one thing. There is this issue right now. I mean, it has been talked about a lot in the past as well about you know about university VCs being appointed by political parties or like you know the ruling party. Do you think that there's enough transparency uh, in that system in the voting or the rep the sorry in the appointment of these VCs? It's always been like that. The search committees are there. They are doing it. Like you see, you have the collegium for appointment of judges. Still, yeah. the is there. You could have a commission, you could have a collegium. At the end of the day, it is a group of people taking a decision, isn't it? Right. right. So how do you, and every person is associated with some organization, with some person, with some ideology. So I don't think it can ever be transparent. Whatever system you may evolve, it can never be the way we want it to be. I, I, I would want it to be. You know, my grandfather was a great historian. He was Dr. Ramprasad Tripathi, a great historian. And he uh, presided over, I don't know how many international uh, history congresses. He was a historian. Uh, so I've seen him, he was a vice chancellor also. I saw how local politics, he was the head of the Department of History in Alabama in 1940s. But there was so much politics in the executive committee. The executive council in those days would vote for the vice chancellor. Right. And he lost by one vote. Why? Because there was casteism, there was uh, groupism. So he was the worthiest, but he could not become the vice chancellor of Allahabad. He became vice chancellor of Madhya Pradesh. I think, you know, uh, transparency as you and I can see can never be whatever body you can make. Okay. It's, uh, ultimately, it's the men, people who are, men who are going to select. So who are those men? Where, who will select them? Who will constitute that body? It's not that 133 crores are going to elect those 10 people who are going to appoint vice chancellors. That, that's fair. That's a fair uh, thing. Yeah. <laughs> um, so while we are on the topic of education, uh, I, I want to ask you, you know, as women, how do we, you know, work towards educating other women and, and you know, uplifting other women? that are around us so i'm sure like you know when we're in a forum like this we're all from very different sectors we're all from you know very different levels of economic activity as well so how how do we essentially create that awareness among women not just here but you know is it gone again oh sorry 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 um yeah this is coming in shweta and uh uh, I am a lot into rural uh, tours because my constituency is primarily rural and my parents always had rural constituencies. 
I feel there's a, there's a great transformation in the mindset. Now you could see parents, you know, hiking their daughters on their bicycle pillion, five kilometers, 10 kilometers to give their exam. And girls are going to school on bicycles. When I move in the morning, and I see hundreds of girl boy, girls going on bicycle to school or walking down nice. to school. Nice. Quantitative change, not only qualitative, I would not say. Quantitative change in these past four or five decades. So ever since this Operation Blackboard came in, and then right to education and how, you know, the, uh, those uh, mid midday meals and the promotion of education, 100% enrollment. So that has created a change. But still girls drop out at five or eight. So to encourage them, we have to ensure that they continue with their, and one reason for their fallout, you know, dropping out at school level is certainly the menstruation. I see most of the girls after the age of 12, they don't know how to you know, manage or handle. Yeah, this definitely is, is a huge issue that I experience. How the government tackle this, how do the society tackle this? That's a big uh, question. Yeah, definitely. So, I mean, sorry, just last two questions because we're actually out of time. But one is, uh, do you think the, is the NEP uh, guidelines now to essentially bring up girl-child enrollment to 100%, is that too ambitious? You know, are, are we not setting enough realistic goals or should we just aim for the sky and let it happen? Whether realistic or unrealistic, you would have to have a goal of 100%. You can't say it's not realistic, so we'll have 70%. If you don't set the target of 100%, you won't achieve 70% also. Makes sense. So you, you have to set your target. And I think the goal is 100%. Whatever we may see, we have Kasturba Gandhi schools now. We have these, these central schools. We have so many now opportunities for so many incentives are being given to the girl child to be in school. So educating the parents is more important. How they benefit from their girl child going to school is important. But let me let us all please remember, if you don't set a higher goal, how will you achieve it? We all know it may not be realistic, but uh, someday it will become realistic. Let's yeah. see. <laughs> um, so I, to end this uh, session, I would like to ask you, Rita Ji, well, is there a poem or a message or a quote that really inspires you that you would like to pass on, not just to the women out here, but the youth of this country? Only one thing is that have confidence in yourself, have self-respect, work hard, and no shortcuts. I see this generation seeking a lot of shortcuts. Be ambitious. But if you go into history, no ambition can be achieved or no desire can be fulfilled without hard work. Intelligence is 25%, 70% is hard work. So let us all, uh, uh, I, we have a lot of hope from the youngsters. They're extremely bright, they're intelligent. In my times, you could not reach uh, the top in your, in your field before 55. Today, 35 is the limit. <laughs> so you can see there's a huge change and we are proud of the youth. So the youth are the future of the country and the women are going to be the bulwark of the country. Absolutely. Thank, Thank you so much, Vita Ji. That was seriously the most inspiring session that we've had. And we really appreciate you for your insights. I'll hand over the session back to Usha Ji and Priya. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Shweta. And thank you, Rita Ji, for that extremely engrossing conversation. I, our chat room is <laughs> full of your uh, you know, praise for your feisty brand of political leadership. And thank you so much. And uh, Shweta, good luck to you. And uh, I think you've got a lot of uh, tidbits from uh, Rita Ji. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> so what came through vociferously, as I could see, was the need for the liberty to take action without pressure and work independently for a transformational leadership. Because like you said, uh, Rita Ji, the consciousness has always, al uh, already there, that's there. And Shweta, you said the power grids are there. So I think we should all find our way and work around that. And uh, this is definitely, definitely a case of by the women, for the women, of the women. So let's hope that sooner than later, we will all be able to set right the skewed gender hierarchy that we feel is there in place in political leadership positions. We will now take a few questions from our audience. Uh, past chairperson,
from Lucknow, Ms. Madhuri Halwasia is wanting to ask you a question. Madhuri ji. Is she there, Pranay? She has stepped out. Let us come back to her. In the meanwhile, Sujini, can you please ask your question? Yes. Namaskar, Rita ji. It was pleasure really listening to you. And Sweta asking your questions was simply super. I really, really enjoyed uh, the session. Thank you. So um, I don't just don't want to take much time, but I just have one simple question. Uh, my question to you is, uh, there is a significant presence of women in politics uh, from the time of independence. But as far as I know about it, or as far as my knowledge goes about it, um, I think that the parliament is not passing the equal rights bill for the women in the parliament. Would, I would like to know here that uh, would they pass any bill to bring in the uh, equality of women, like about like how they talk as a 50% equality in the parliament? Would there be any way that it can be done as soon as possible or something? Whom is this question directed to? It's directed to you, Rita Ji. Okay, okay. Well, I've always been a, a proponent of women's reservation bill for high legislatures. And there was a time when I had about 30 lakh signatures from all the country uh, and presented to the prime minister for the passage of this bill. I think uh, sooner than later, this bill will see the light of the day. Because you see, what women are looking for is a level, field, a level playing ground. And that doesn't come because in every democracy, in a democracy, money plays a significant role and power plays a significant role. It's a male-dominated area, so they don't want to give up their positions or their uh, or their seats to women. So unless and until there is reservation for women, we will be, we will get stuck to 15%. And this is the best that we have done. See, 5% in 1952, 15% in 2020. So by the time it is, I don't know what, next millennium that we may be getting 50%. So I feel that uh, we should all, we should all start campaigning for the women's reservation. We in the political system within our own parties and you as a society or as social groups, we should start now talking about this. Wonderful, thank you so much. Kushbu Baird has a question for uh, Shweta. Hi Shweta. Lovely evening to both of you. And Rita Ji, you were simply very nice. It was very informative. Shweta, I would like to ask you about, um, you know, about Hillary Clinton. She was a perceived strong female leader, renowned across the world. Why do you think, and I think he was, you know, very close to becoming U US president as well. Why do you think she lost? So that, that's a very good question. Very good question. Yeah, let me actually clarify by saying Hillary Clinton actually didn't lose the popular vote in the United States. Actually, she won by 30 lakh votes, as in 30 lakh more Americans actually wanted her to be the president over Trump. But it's essentially, there's this system in the United States, I'm sure you might have heard it before, called the Electoral College, wherein when you vote for the president of the United States, the importance or the influence that your vote has actually depends entirely on which state you're in. So if I, if I can simplify it a little more, and let's take a scenario where Hillary and Trump were actually tied, and uh, we give them each 10 extra votes, right? And we tell them you place them in whichever state you want to. And Hillary puts them in a state called Wyoming, and uh, Trump puts it in a state called California. So now Hillary would have actually won the entire presidency because the 10 votes in Wyoming actually matter more in the presidential election than those 10 votes in California. 
So that is actually how she lost the presidency. She, I, I always say like, this is a soft point for me because I always say she didn't lose the election. She lost the presidency because of the electoral college system. And, you know, if you actually take this, uh, if you analyze it a little deeper, um, essentially she, Hillary didn't get the presidency because only 80,000 people didn't vote for her in the right states. So even though she had a majority, because she didn't get those 80,000 votes in the correct states, she lost the election. And you can, you know, there's a big analysis in terms of like why she actually might have lost in those states. These middle, middle uh, sorry, it's called the Midwest. Essentially, it's Michigan, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin. These are states that, you know, uh, essentially you have to wonder whether the electorate is a little more conservative and whether, you know, obviously there's a lot of discussion around how her scandals actually affected her. You know, there was this thing with her emails and, you know, about her being paid for speeches on Wall Street, etc. So there were scandals, but you have to then compare it to the kind of scandals that we saw coming from the Trump camp. Right, so you, I'm sure you must have heard of just the myriad of scandals that came out. So then is there a gender difference in what we expect out of our leaders, whether a female leader is held to a bigger pedestal than a man, like a male leader? Sorry, I think Rita, she wanted to say something. To that. She had the baggage of the incumbent government also with her. Absolutely, absolutely. That is a very important aspect. Had she been a new candidate, right. then she would have won. Absolutely. Because the baggage was there with her and Clinton was not so popular at that time. Right. I think that also took away some of her. And the women all over the world were very unhappy. I was also very unhappy that she did. <laughs> <laughs> I, it was, it was I, did, I switched off my phones. I didn't want to talk to anyone. But I mean, amazed why she lost. Right. Absolutely. It's definitely a step back for us because it got so close. It got so close to actually getting it to breaking that glass ceiling. And now we've regressed. We don't even have one nominee in this current race that's coming up in 2020. That's a, that's a woman. So yeah. I wonder how, how many more years we'll actually go until we get to that point again. So thank you so much, Pushpu, for that question. Nice thank question. you. So much. This is a question from me, actually, to both Ritaji and then to Shweta. So the recent learnings from the way the pandemic was handled in nations led by women seems to tell us, uh, you know, kind of uh, mirror the belief that women have an emotional and nurturing edge that can work wonders at any level of office. Do you think it's really the case? And do you think that's enough? I think gender doesn't come in between, uh, it's not a very big factor in this matter. Though I say that women have more grit, they are more determined, and they're certainly more sensitive to social issues than men are. And uh, when we see women leaders, maybe not all of them, but the best rulers and best leaders, you'll have, you know, I think dozens of names of women coming to the forefront, in, in the front. So I feel that women uh, do have the capacity and with their capacity, they have found their space at the top also. So it's not your emotion or your, your, or your temperament or character that makes you. It's a holistic uh, approach uh, towards an uh, area or towards a field or towards a situation that they did. Not all Mrs. Thatcher was known as the Iron Lady, Mrs. Gandhi was known as the Iron Lady, but the Nike took in such a difficult position. Look at uh, the Southeast Asia women leaders in the Philippines are everywhere. So there have been good women leaders, but I'm sorry that America has not, US did not get a woman leader, which I hope in the future will come. Because that's the biggest democracy. India has thrown up leaders, but not uh, women leaders. So I think that that is a part of a you know, issue, but not in entirety. It's a knowledge or great your effort. That makes you. Sweta, do you agree or you have to add to that? No, actually, uh, I love the way you phrase that because, uh, you know, I, I did uh, study psychology as well in school. And there are, in fact, studies that support the fact that women, are, women leaders are better listeners than male leaders. And, you know, they are actually more emphatic in terms of the way they actually carry out their governance. But... I mean, it is a possible factor that why, you know, some women leaders and some women-led countries are doing better in the COVID situation. Obviously, there, there are factors like, you know, the, I'm sure you've seen where, you know, the UK 
uh, and the US and, the Brazil, and Brazil, their uh, leaders essentially first went with this hyper masculine approach to it, where you know they actually rejected that the, the pandemic is as serious as it is. So obviously that would have hurt them in their efforts later. So obviously, like you know, there are also a lot of different factors. There's you know factors like population size and and development status of each of these nations, or you know, and or the the, the female leaders or the male leaders themselves. Obviously, their personality also factors in, and their ability factors in. So I don't think we can generalize and say that women leaders are doing better, but I, I love that we're actually discussing it, we're highlighting it. You know, it's all over the, the world. Like we're seeing news reports about it every single day. And I love that. I love that we're celebrating these women leaders and that the COVID situation actually brought them to light. And that, that's a great step for us. Thank you, Shweta. And thank you, Ritaji. Thank you so much. Now I'll hand you over to Senior Vice Chairperson Umachi Gurupati to deliver the vote of thanks. A very good evening. What an amazingly inspirational and powerful session. Have confidence, self-respect, work hard, no shortcuts. Well said, Ritaji. Thank you so much. Every citizen has certain responsibilities towards the society. Amongst those, Political action is the highest responsibility. In every field, we know that diversity is very important. In politics too, it is imperative to have women leaders in the success of decision making. Today, we witness women leader who won the hearts of people around her or who choose to follow her by her leadership skills, especially by proving that one has the moral responsibility to disobey or raise the voice against unjust. Rita Ji, thank you for the words of wisdom and guidance. Your encouraging words mean a lot to us. Please accept our heartfelt gratitude. Thank you so Enjoy. much once again. Enjoyed every moment. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Shweta, you have done an excellent job, exceptionally well, and taken forward the conversation so smoothly with thought-provoking and interesting questions. You are full of energy. Congratulations and all the best. Thank you so much. I, th <laughs> I thank all our sponsors Mustang Services and Matrix Jewels, Polomon Group, our gold partners, RBC Worldwide, our branding partners, and Pushpam Publications, our gifting partners. I thank all our past chairs, media, fellow flow members, and all the viewers for joining us today. My appreciation to all the community members and the technical team who worked tirelessly in bringing out this program. So before I close, I would like to add, we all know that today is National Hand Loan Day. So please, all of us, let us take a oath that we, we wear hand loans as often as possible to promote our uh, you know, weavers, our artisans, and also our culture. So let us do that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Jai Thank Hind. You. Thank you. Jai Hind. On behalf of Chairperson Usharani Mane and the committee, I thank you all once again for joining us here today. We have a very active next week, starting with the launch of FMC Hyderabad on Monday. So stay alert and updated. But before that, I will ask for our sponsor slides to come in.
thank you IT team. Everybody have a very peaceful, safe and healthy weekend. We'll see you on Monday.